left, we I was asking you all, which of the following presidents do you think was the most effective? And of course, some of you said, you know, JFK saved the world, and there was agreement about that. And so, there's no right answer for it. I mean, because we all, first off, we have to define exactly what is effectiveness. And of course, you know, I feel strongly about Jimmy Carter. You know, Jimmy Carter is the president that uh, we need but don't deserve. <laughs> But anyways, so let's talk about the uh, basis of presidential power. Uh, the first one being the political parties. Uh, presidents rely on their partisans for help, but presidents cannot control their party. Uh, back in 2009 and in 2010, Obama had large Democratic majorities in both the House and the Senate. And after that, so 2012 and onwards, he had to work with uh, congressional Republican majorities and you know back in 2017 through 2019 Trump had a full red DC um, but you know it just because you have your party is in control of both the presidency the house and the Senate doesn't mean everything is going to be a cakewalk uh, even when presidents have majorities uh, of their own party controlling both chambers of Congress commerce changes chambers of Congress there are even fissures within the major party coalition that make it difficult to accomplish everything they'd like to likewise the power of the minority to filibuster especially in the Senate limits the power of even a unified president as well as his or her congressional party so recall especially for the Obama administration look how long it took for uh, him look how long it took for Obama to actually create draft and pass the Affordable Health Care Act and even to this day they're still trying to repeal it likewise for President Trump is the wall up yet Look how long it's taking for him to build the wall. We really haven't heard anything else about that wall. Y'all can like look it up and let me know in the comments or whatever if that wall is actually built. What's the status of it? Or are we more so, you know, focusing on not dying from the coronavirus? And so the second base of power, going public. Uh, going public is a tactic uh, through which presidents seek to force members of Congress to support their policies by directly appealing to and mobilizing the public. Uh, presidents start have increasingly started to rely on this tactic uh, throughout the 20th century uh, via speeches, radio, television, and now the internet. And so I have two examples of what it's like to go public. Uh, the tactic of going public started way back, if we count in the 20th century, the first one to do it was President FDR with his fireside chats via the radio when he was promising people, what was it, a chicken in every pot and something else. I can't remember the rest of it. I know Mr. Chrisman from AP US History would be very disappointed. but chicken in every pot promising that the you know that we would bounce back from the Great Depression as well as you know the country would not lose World War II etc and so with that in mind I do have two videos uh, you know as we learned Monday I can't show the videos all the way because you know copyright material but I will play the first 10 to 15 seconds to encourage you all to find it on YouTube. Google is your friend. We all know how to use Google and watch it that way. I apologize in advance. I have this really bad glare. But the first one is going to be uh, from President Reagan uh, and it's going to highlight his remarkable ability to communicate through television. Uh, and the clip in particular is uh, his speech to the nation right after the uh, space uh, the the space shuttle Challenger was lost when it like exploded and came down upon impact. So, if you want to Google it so you can watch it, uh, the name, the caption, the title of the video on YouTube is Challenger semicolon. Not semicolon, challenger, regular colon, uh, President Reagan's challenger Dis disaster speech, and that's 12886. My planned speech is tonight to report on the state of the union. And the events of earlier today have led me to change those plans. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. 
Nancy and I are pain to the core for the tragedy of the shuttle challenge. We know we share this pain with all the people of our country. This is truly a national loss. Nineteen years ago, almost to the day, we lost three astronauts in a terrible accident on the ground. But we've never lost an astronaut in flight. We've never had a tragedy like this. And perhaps we've forgotten the courage it took for the crew of the shuttle. But they, the Challenger 7, were aware of the dangers, overcame them, and did their jobs brilliantly. We mourn seven heroes, Michael Smith, Dick Scoby, Judith Resnick, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McAuliffe. All right. So you can listen to the rest of that speech on your own time. And the purpose of it is so that you can see how effective President Reagan was at communicating both his disappointment and trying to encourage the nation to really appreciate the astronaut's sacrifice as well as trying to continue encourage support for NASA. And like it's one of the few times like you see how charismatic President Reagan was. Like he like if you when you look at the clips you'll see like he's sitting in the Oval Office, in his office, and you see there are pictures of his family around him. And it makes it feel like you're walking into like your grandfather or your father's study and he's having this, you know, facts of life talk with you. It's very powerful. Uh, the second video is actually from the Obama administration and that video is uh, identifying the ways in which uh, the president's personal characteristics are used as a source of power. Uh, during the Obama administration, we all know that he was consistently criticized for being too aloof or for failing to become angry enough. And so this clip comes from the last White House Correspondents' Dinner with Obama, uh, and he actually invites, uh, gosh, it's not uh, Jordan Peele, it's Michael, uh, Michael Key. Uh, who, of course, if you watch the show on Comedy Central, Key and Peele, uh, you'll see that uh, Michael Key was, what's it call it, was Luther, Obama's anger translator. And so President Obama actually used him as his anger translator at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And so if you want to watch that clip, all fun and stuff, what you just have to search for, the name of the video in particular, is called President Obama's Anger Translator at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And so for this one, I don't think I can go a full minute before YouTube will shut it down, but it's such a great video. There are plenty of videos uh, showing the uh, long-running sketch on YouTube, but this is just an example of how a president actually used it to poke fun at himself. ...between me and the press, but uh, honestly, what they say doesn't bother me. I understand we've got an adversarial system. I'm a mellow sort of guy. And that's why I invited Luther, my anger translator, to join me here tonight. watch the rest of the video YouTube it moving onward so let's talk about the third base being the personal president personal president being the personal president personable president uh, of course, as presidents increasingly went public, uh, their personal characteristics and skills also become more important. And so as we saw, not as we saw, as you heard briefly in the uh, clip from Reagan's speech about the Challenger, 
Uh, ultimately, his success in divided government was attributed to his ability to communicate through TV, a skill he honed as an actor. Yeah, that's right, folks. Prior to becoming president and then being gov no, not then. Prior to becoming governor of California and then ultimately becoming president, Ronald Reagan was a pawn of Hollywood. He was an actor. Yes, he was. And so, but there are some downsides to being a personable, a personal president, and that's approval ratings. Uh, one of the problems primarily is that, you know, presidents become less popular over time. And what we see in this graph in particular, let me see, can I go back and control it? Yes, I can. What we see, you know, starting with LBJ's uh, tenure, that he started off with, you know, 80 80 percent back in 64 I mean you have to start off high you know JFK just died and LBJ is finishing off his tenure and then starting off his own administration but by the time you know he left it was down to uh, about 40 percent same thing for Nixon of course it increased and then you know of course Watergate happened and then of course he was less than 30 percent same thing with Ford and its extremely small tenure. I think it, it dropped immediately after uh, he announced that he wasn't going to uh, press charges that he, uh, what's it called? He acquitted uh, or pardoned Nixon. And so, of course, popularity fell with the quickness. The president that we need but don't deserve, of course, he left higher. But it wasn't as pop he wasn't as popular as he was when he first started his administration. And then even then we fast forward and even look at Clinton. Actually, Clinton's approval rating was higher at the end of his administration than it was at the beginning. Uh, Reagan's, even though it dipped and you know increased and decreased for a while, it was pretty uh, stable. If we just compare the first note, the starting point, and the ending note, uh, Daddy Bush was a bit more volatile. And even for Obama, yeah, his approval ratings were slightly lower than they were when he started. But that's what happens when you rely a lot on being personable. The media reports more on what would used to be considered trivial aspects of your life. What is your wife wearing? How is your wife carrying herself? What about the children? Even down to the types of clothes that you wear. It's every single aspect of your life as the president is scrutinized from beginning to end and that's all because we are interested in having a personable president not just being able to lead the country but also being interesting enough that you know if the if the possibility ever arises you can go out for a beer with the president because that's what matters to people How do I think that? Alright. So more about the basis of the president. Let's talk about the administrative aspects of it. Of course, as the limits of going public have become more apparent, contemporary presidents have turned more and more to executive powers to achieve policy goals. And that includes increasing the size and importance of the executive office of the president, increasing use of regulatory review. Uh, increasing directives to agencies via directive, not directive, executive orders, and then increasing the use of signed statements. Uh, the use of these administrative strategies are not always successful, though. Uh, for one, federal courts have struck down unilateral uh, actions by the president. Um, also, members of Congress have been increasingly vocal and concerned about unilateral presidential action. Uh, lastly, these executive actions do not quite have the same staying power as laws passed by Congress. Future presidents can always reverse executive orders and seek to roll back other executive or other executive actions in time. So I don't know if you recall, like immediately during the first hundred days of the uh, Trump administration, Trump promised to reverse every single executive order that Obama had ever placed. And that's like the downside of executive orders. If they choose to, presidents can sit down and roll back previous executive orders. And so can you imagine like what type of work and progress would be made in a nation if each and every time a president came in, they decided, you know what, I'm going to reverse every single executive order that the prior president, that the prior administration have done. Nothing will never get done. It'll just be petty tit for tat, tit for tat. 
But luckily, not everybody's like that. And I don't even think Trump actually reversed every single executive order. I think it was just only lip service. So something to think about on your own time, do you have a positive or negative impression of bureaucracy? And so when you think of bureaucracy, what do you first think of? Do you think of pencil pushers? Do you think of a term that just describes something that you're not really sure of? What I usually uh, tell students to think about is the first time you got your learner's permit. Or for those of you that can drive, the first time you went and got your driver's license. When you took that writing test and then that driving test, was there a lot of people down at the DMV? Did it seem like you had to stand in line forever to fill out this one form, turn in that form, pay the fee, and then stand in another line? That's a type of bureaucracy for you. Was it a positive process? Or even on campus, going to see the financial aid lady or going to you know the financial aid department, is it a lot? Is it only like two chairs and a lot of people waiting around? That is a educational administrative version of bureaucracy, where it's like, oh, I have to turn in this form, wait to hear back from this person, stand in this line, see this person behind a desk. If you have positive experiences, you're probably more likely to look at bureaucracy in a more positive way, and if it's negative, more negative. Like I know when I'm home for the summer, I have to take my grandmother down to the DMV to pay the uh, registration fees for the car. And I hate it each and every time I go because I've never had a positive experience when I go to the Georgia DMV. It's never fun. Except for like that one time my high school classmate used to work at the DMV. That would be cool because she you know, always helped me speed through the process a little quicker. But usually I hated it. And so, believe it or not, most people think that bureaucracies are a waste in government. Like, it costs a lot of money and doesn't get things done. And so this chart from the ANES data, if I recall correctly, shows that the general public believes there is a lot of waste in government. And they're also more inclined to believe that the government wastes a lot of money nowadays than they thought 50 years ago. So even right now in 2012, the last time we asked this question, it was a little less than 80%. We can say 75% of Americans thought that the government wasted a lot of money. So let's talk about the bureaucracy in a democracy. And so the executive branch, of course, implements policies uh, that, so, to do so means that it's a bureaucracy. And so all that means is that it's just characterized by the specialization of functions, as well as an adherence to rules and a hierarchy of authority. Uh, the bureaucracy is frequently used as a bad term and is associated with inefficiency and delay. But the bureaucracy is actually employed, it's used in the name of efficiency, speed, and equity. The bureaucracy is necessary. So what the heck is a bureaucracy? All it is is just a complex structure of offices, tasks, rules, and principles of organization that are employed by law, all large-scale institutions to coordinate the work of their personnel. The core of a bureaucracy is the hierarchical organization that employs a division of labor and specializations. And so the best way to think about a bureaucracy is to imagine a firm, a business that has 1,000 employees and we're manufacturing cars. Uh, one form of organization would be to ask every single worker to perform every single task in manufacturing the car. And so each worker would put together a car as fast as he or she could as an individual. So 1,000 workers and each one is tasked with making a car each person's task with making a car. Now some people can probably put together their cars quicker than others and of course them to be safe and operable. And eh, maybe if you're lucky you could uh, churn out X amount of viable cars a day. However, a better way to do it would actually be to uh, ask different groups of workers to divide up the labor and instead specialize on working on one part of the car. So one group can focus on building the frame, another one focus on installing the seats, 
another one focused on building the actual engine, installing the windows, etc. Uh, and with this division of labor and specialization, it comes with a lot more advantages. The first one being that workers will instead focus on a single task. And so as a result, they can carry out that task with greater uh, expertise and greater speed. Uh, second, because each unit is going through the same process, there's greater consistency in the end product. And so basically each car off the line will be as great and the very exact same, the very exact same, and same as the last car. And so which one do you want? Everybody making their own car or specialized teamwork in which all the cars come out the same and even possibly quicker? You want option number two. And so, bureaucratic organization enhances efficiency through the division of labor and specialization. Uh, bureaucracies allow governments to operate by allowing large-scale coordination of individuals working on a task. And so while this concept of bureaucracy is a relatively new term, the concept is as old as time. Uh, he, uh, you know, art ad, ad Architectural feats such as the Great Wall of China, uh, the Egyptian and Mayan pyramids, and even the great feats of Roman construction are the uh, products of large-scale organization of people. Uh, the division of labor, maybe a little slavery, uh, and specialization. Likewise, ancient military organization also utilized the same concepts of hierarchy, division of labor, and specialization. So while we call it bureaucracy, the concept is the concept and the practice of it has been around since the dawn of time. So what do bureaucrats do? They do three things. They implement, they make rules, and they do administrative adjudication. So what is implementation? It just describes the efforts of departments and agencies to translate laws and regulation into action. Uh, what do I mean by rulemaking? It's just talking about the quasi-legislative administrative process that produces regulations. And then finally, for administrative adjudication, it's talking about the application of rules and precedents to specific cases to settle disputes. And so we're gonna go in piece by piece. And so why do we have bureaucracies? Well, first things first, they serve politicians. So we've already talked about two answers previously, efficiency as well as speedy and equitable implementation. The third reason for bureaucracy is politics. Uh, legislators find it useful to delegate some decisions. I can't focus on everything. I have to go legislate. And so luckily I can have these people here in the corner Focus on this aspect of this policy. Make sure it's implemented and applied properly. Likewise, sometimes legislators lack expertise or prefer for decisions to be made by objective bureaucrats rather than by interested politicians. I represent North Dakota. Really rural. I don't know anything about it. And you're asking me to provide uh, informed and make, do, make an informed decision on policies related to housing and urban development? What is that? Maybe I have someone or access to a bureaucrat, staffers or whoever, and staffers are a type of bureaucracy that will instead be experts or more informed or actually have the ability to actually study and learn more about the process related to that program and then they can inform me of the inform me of the ins and outs or at least give me an executive summary about the housing and urban program in question and then I'll be able to make an informed decision. But I essentially outs outsourced my research and efforts to a staffer which is a part of the bureaucracy. And so how is the executive branch organized when we're thinking about back to the presidency? So you have your cabinet department, your independent agencies, your government corporations, and then your independent regulatory commissions. So we're gonna talk about exactly how does that look. And so in thinking about a cabinet, 
So this is actually one of the cabinet departments, in particular, the Department of Agriculture. So you see you have your secretary, then your deputy secretary, and then you have your chief, econ chief economist, your director of national appeals, communications, inspector general, general counsel, all of these people. And then also at this same second level includes all of these people here. We have a lot of people. So you see, it's not just Sonny Perdue who is the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. There's a lot of people under S uh, Sonny Perdue. I don't know who the Deputy Secretary is, but the Deputy Secretary rep reports to Sonny and then all these people report to the Deputy. Ultimately, the key takeaway from this figure is that the typically hierarchical form uh, that a cabinet level takes, that's all it is. It's a pyramid. Not a pyramid scheme, but it's a pyramid. It's a lot of stuff that goes on. And so let's talk about the four missions of agencies. The first one being clientele. Uh, clientele agencies uh, are Blah, 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 blah. Clientele agencies typically have field offices to serve their clientele. Uh, it's basically a department or bureau of government whose mission it is to serve, promote, or represent a particular interest. These include agriculture, labor, transportation, veterans affairs, etc. Clientele agencies have offices in, in localities. Clientele agencies have field offices local to their clientele. So I could always go and find, you know, a local branch of the, uh, of the Department of Veterans Affairs. I can always find a VA office. If I really needed to find a office related to agriculture, I probably could. I don't know if it's in Columbus. I feel like it's far more like, I'm not in a rural area, but I mean, if I wanted to, I could find a Department of Agriculture's office around here. But I do know where the VA offices are. There's one in Columbus, there's one in Cleveland, there's one in Cincinnati. Second mission of the agencies, maintenance of the union. Uh, these agencies are related to the core functions of keeping the government safe and secure. And so examples of these include revenue agencies and then agencies devoted to internal security and external security. So what do I mean by revenue agencies? You know, the, the uh, internal, what is it? Blah, 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 blah. Internal Re uh, Re Reserve Review, uh, what does the IRS stand for? Let's find out real quick. Clearly I'm having a brain fart, so I apologize in advance. Oh no, I can't believe I closed it. That's awkward. Yes, internal, internal revenue service. Wow, early morning y'all. Internal revenue service uh, for internal security issues related to domestic issues and disagreements and conflicts. That's the Department of Justice. And then for external security, you know, protecting our nation state against terrorism and other ne'er-do-wells, that is the Department of Defense. Defense. <laughs> Defense. Ah, I cracked myself up. Third mission, regulatory agencies. And so regulatory agencies refer to departments, bureaus, or independent agencies whose primary mission is to ensure that individuals and organizations comply with the statutes under its jurisdiction. And so examples of this include the FDA and OSHA. And so regulatory agencies have a lot of power for obvious reasons. Uh, they can enact rules and effective, that are effectively legislation by another name. Uh, and that can actually severely limit individual and firm behavior, and that uh, including affecting all manner of economic and social activity. Uh, not surprisingly, there's been a lot of effort to curb uh, independent, regulatory independence in recent decades, both by presidents and by Congress, through more strict scrutiny of executive appointments and through laws like the Negotiated Rulemaking Act. So. In terms of like when I think of the FDA, it's like when there's like a new medicine or a new health treatment that comes out and something happens and then they do a recall and then now that you all are home and you have the opportunity to watch more daytime TV trash, you'll see like those random uh, law lawyer commercials where it's like, if you or someone you know has someone you know has taken Johnson uh, Johnson's baby powder, used Johnson's baby powder and developed ovarian cancer, 
you might have a case. And in recent ruling, the FDA has determined that Johnson's baby powder it causes ovarian cancer, or the one I've seen a lot. Uh, yeah, you, using Roundup causes cancer. If you or someone you know use Roundup and develop cancer, please call, blah, 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 blah. That's the only time I think of the FDA. And finally, the fourth <clears throat> mission of agencies, the redistributive part. Redistributive part, redistributive agencies. Uh, these refer to agencies that influence money supply, the role of the government in the economy, and then finally, the redistribution of wealth. Uh, examples of what redistributive agencies do include focusing on financial, not financial, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and then welfare policy. So what do I mean by fiscal policy? I'm talking about spending and taxing. And that's largely influenced by the Department of the Treasury. Uh, second, monetary policy refers to regulating money supply. And that's largely influenced by the Federal Reserve. And then welfare policy relates to transfers of wealth. And that's, uh, you know, to a lesser extent focused by Social Security. We'll see. And so when we actually think of transfers of wealth, yeah, we're really talking about Social Security. Uh, most people think when we think of welfare policy, we're talking about SNAP, Medicaid, TANF. We're not talking about that because, but, you know, when you think of welfare, you think of welfare programs. But these popular programs, actually not these popular, uh, Social Security and programs of that sort, these not, no, things of that sort, Medicare, Medicaid, these are actually the most popular welfare policy programs and they focus with transfers of wealth and they're most likely to be used by the middle class and not the poor because of course you have to work at a decent paying job that takes out money for social security and of course when you become old you have the opportunity to cash in and receive your social security checks and of course i think we talked about it at the beginning of the semester the largest proportion, the largest part of the American budget is focusing on these pre-established programs. The being the, the most expensive ones are Social Security and Medicare. And so, who oversees the bureaucracy? Is it Congress, the President, the courts, the people, or all of the above? The answer is E, all of the above. The bureaucracy has many, many masters, including internal audits and self-regulating controls, and everybody and their grandmother can oversee the bureaucracy. And so we return back to these questions about, you know, related back to the issue of the principal-agent relationship. The problem of bureaucratic control being motivation. Bureaucrats can be conceived of as rational actors who are budgetary maximizers. Uh, greater prestige and responsibility come from running a larger enterprise. Likewise, bureaucrats generally believe in the mission of the agency and want resources to do more. And ultimately, Congress ends up, Congress and the President ultimately have difficulty distinguishing need from want. And so I actually have a video, you should Google it, it's on, I think it's also on YouTube, but I pulled it up from a Comedy Central's website, but there's a video uh, where, in which, from the Colbert Report, uh, where Stephen Colbert interviews Michael Brown, the uh, former director of FEMA, he oversaw the clusterfuck that was FEMA's response to Hurricane Katrina. And of course, you know, it was so awful that eventually, you know, he was fired. You know, he had to answer to uh, Congress about the lackluster response and uh, implementation of FEMA during that time. Uh, but anyways, uh, Michael Brown talks with uh, Stephen Colbert and talks about exactly how he was made the scapegoat but ultimately the failures of FEMA were actually related to just the state's lack of investment as well as response and preparation in FEMA for a disaster of this magnitude.
So cc.com, The Colbert Report, Michael Brown. You're going to make me watch an ad again, aren't you? Oh, okay. My guest tonight is the former FEMA chief. Let's see how he handles the aftermath of Hurricane Colbert. Please welcome Michael Brown. <laughs> control B is the principal agent relationship. Bureaucrats, as we said before, can be understood as agents of, of elected officials. The elected officials are the principal and then the bureaucrats are the agents. And so with the, within this relationship are two potential problems. The first one being bureaucratic drift. And this is a problem in which implementation is more so to the liking of the bureaucracy than it is to the original intention of the policy or of the program. The second uh, problem that can arise is coalitional drift, which is enacted policy changes uh, because the enacting coalition is temporary. So you get a creation, a, a coalition of agents that want to oversee a program, make sure or support this program and want to make sure it's good and great. And then one day the institutional support is gone. The eight, not the agent, the principal support is gone, leaving the bureaucrats to try and figure this out on their own. It's like saying, oh, all these people will, you know, help donate and help see you through the process. And then you go out and do X, Y, and Z, and now you're trying to get the support that was promised to you, and it's no longer there because people have picked up, moved on, decided not to care or be interested in it anymore. So bureaucratic drift, the pencil pusher that is very interested and wants the program to be run as they see fit and not according to the description of the legislation or the program by the principals, uh, coalitional drift, the principal support disappears. And so there are other issues that can arise from bureaucracies, uh, not from, but within bureaucratic uh, organizations, and that's termination and devolution. Uh, one way that we can go about reducing the size of the bureaucracy would be to eliminate programs and agencies. But that is extremely hard to do, especially with clientele agencies. Could you imagine if the VA, the Department of v Veterans Affairs, just like decided to close up offices right and left or to try and scale back programming? There would be riots in the street. Why would there be? Because America loves its veterans. America, veterans. They need the, asso they need the assistance. However, you don't have to do that per se. You don't have to pack up the VA. What you could do instead is devolve the program. And all devolution is, is just the practice and policy of removing a program from one level of government and essentially passing the buck down to the lower level. And it's another way to downsize the federal government. So instead of, so it wouldn't be the VA. The VA is not a good, uh, good option. 
And it wouldn't be the Department of Labor either. I'm trying to think of an example in which that happens. Something that was on the federal level and it's now down to the state level. TANF. So while uh, the federal government provides block grants for funding, so actual money for TANF, Temporary Aid to Needy Families, the new welfare program. While the federal government provides funding for various states for that, it is actually up to the states to implement the programs. Each state sets its own thresholds and criteria for eligibility for TANF. That's an example of devolution. Once, what was once a federal program, now it's still a federal, it has federal financing, federal funding, but it's not being implemented on a federal level, it's implemented on a state level. And so uh, devolution by definition means greater local control as well as greater variation in policy amongst states and localities. Uh, there are absolute advantages and disadvantages to this policy, but as a means of downsizing, it just simply passes the onus of paying government and employment of bureaucrats onto the states. And so indeed, government employment at the local level has risen dramatically in recent decades, and that's because it's the greatest areas of government employment, education, healthcare, and prison, they're managed at the state and local level. And so our final slides for this section, privatization, so you can either devolve pass the program from the federal level down to the state or from the state to the local level and that's of course just keeping it within the governmental sphere itself or you can take the program and give it over to the private companies give it to the private sphere and that process is known as privatization that's the act of moving all or part of a program from the public sector to the private sector this also can reduce the size of government uh, some public responsibilities, like trash collection, can be privatized more easily than others can. Nevertheless, privatization is an increasing popular policy innovation. So I don't know if you all ever had the opportunity to watch Orange is the New Black. That's an, a dr dramatized example of drama dramatized, dramatized, woo, dramatized version of privatization as it relates to prisons. Uh, the, prison the prison industrial complex, privatization of prisons, this is an example of that. So of course in Orange is the New Black, the, I can't even remember the name of, I know they were in, up, you know, in uh, upstate New York, but anyways, that the jail that Piper et al. were in was sold to a private company. Uh, that company oversaw implementation of the jail's day-to-day day-to-day -day operations and of course you know that's when they were like working under you know under the table for their equivalent of Victoria's Secrets making those panties all that other stuff that's an example of privatization so what ends up happening is the state the state government in particular has deemed it uh, cheaper or even uh, profit profitable to actually let this private company oversee the implementation of program X, program Y, or in this example, I'm using the jails. And so, of course, this allows the government to downsize while still making sure that the prisoners are still, you know, taken care of, they're receiving their punishments, they're being, there's oversight, etc. Now, there's all types of issues that can arise with privatization. Uh, being, you know, the employment of less than stellar, or not even uh, qualified employees, other issues, subpar care or oversight, uh, as it relates to uh, trash collection. So not all areas have, you know, a, their public governments, their local governments actually oversee trash removal. So for example, in my, uh, not home and house complex, but in my uh, condo area, we have private, uh, what's it called, it? trash collectors, which I hate with a passion. I miss the city government, the city removal, because when we first moved in, we didn't have trash cans. All we had to do was just put our trash bags out on the end of the street, and we have a coyote problem, and uh, it would just be awful, and it caused people to instead wait until like 6.45 in the morning to take the trash out, which of course, if you're a sleepy or a sleep-loving person like myself, that sucks. So instead... The uh, housing complex changed 
collectors. And now we have a collector that has given us a, not, it's not even big, it's a small trash can. It actually only holds two trash bags, which of course the trash only comes once a week. So now we have, especially now that we're home now 24 seven, we have a lot of trash, but they won't take tra the trash if it's not in the garbage can. So now I just have a bunch of garbage bags in my backyard. Eventually, I'll, find, I'll, I'll go find a dumpster to throw away. But that's also a downside of privatization. Don't move into places and you don't find out how exactly the trash collection works. Anyways, this brings us to the end of the Oval Office section. On Friday, we will pick up with the court system because now we are going to accelerate through the rest of the sections so we all can be ready for the final exam. Y'all enjoy the rest of your day.